Okay, uh, we have now started recording. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on the uh, Coastal Highway Route E39 project. Uh, this is just uh, one of a series of webinars, and today we have the pleasure of uh, uh, presenting Tala Osland, who will be uh, uh, presenting on her work on flow around a submerged floating uh, tube bridge. Uh, Tal is currently uh, in uh, Iowa, so uh, that's why we're doing a little bit uh, at a different time than uh, the normal <clears throat> 10 o'clock presentation on uh, on Fridays. So um, uh, I've uh, presented to you, Tala, so um, I think I'll just uh, leave it all up to you. Tala? I can't seem to hear anything uh, from you. Have you muted uh, while... Uh... Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Perfect. Okay, great. Perfect. Uh, let's start again. Okay, so, um, yes, so my presentation will be about flow around a submerged floating tube bridge, sometimes known as a submerged floating tunnel, some of you. My background is marine hydrodynamics for the Marine Technology Department at NTNU. I will start going through some background and problem formulation. Um, I will assume that most of you the rudimentary fluid dynamics with separation and vortex shedding, so I will not go through that in detail. But I will talk about flow around tandem cylinder in, in a very general aspect, and then I will present some of my work, which is a uh, direct numerical simulation of tandem cylinders at a Reynolds number of 10,000. And I will talk very briefly about what I'm doing right now. So, the background. Some of you, or most of you, have probably seen this picture before. It is the Bernafjord SFTB. It's what I've been using for my base case. You no, know, there, there can be several types of submerged floating tube bridges uh, with different spacings between the tubes. Some of them may be single tube. Some of them may be further towards the free surface or further into the water. But the basics are all there. So from a hydrodynamics point of view, the most important thing about this is that the main structure is fully submerged. You could have a version of this which had, had pontoons floating on the surface, but I'm not taking that into account in my work. So the primary environmental loads on this are wave loads, the wind-induced current, and tidal loads. And from my point of view, all of these are current loads. So the Submerged Floating Tube Bridge, or SFTB, which I will start saying now, uh, is subjected to wind-induced currents and tidal currents. So from a, from a time point of view, both of these current types are uniform, meaning that they don't change their direction very often. So you can look at them as a uniform, formally inflowing current. And then you have the waves, and waves will induce oscillating currents, as you can see from the from the image here. Uh, can you see my pointer, by the way, Matthias? No, probably not. Yes, yeah, we, can see, we see, see it. it. You can, okay, great. But only when you move it, and then it disappears yes. after a few seconds. Okay, this is good. So, as you can see from the image here, you have these. Uh, circular motion currents that are induced by the waves and they diminish as you go further into the water. And how far they are felt into the water depends on the wavelength. So the longer the wavelength, the further into the water you can actually feel these currents. 
and because you will always have swell or nearly always have swell in a fjord, the SFTB will nearly always be subjected to oscillating currents. Now, the topic of my PhD is the flow field around the bridge, and that includes the sea surface and its influence. I could also include uh, shallow water if the bridge was somehow coming onto land where the water was very shallow beneath it, that would definitely have an impact on flow field. Also, where the, where the bridge comes into the, to, uh, the wall, like at the abutments, there will be a different flow because of the wall. Oscillating currents, like I just said, is definitely a part of my PhD. Uh, what I don't do is fluid structure inter interaction. So I'm only looking at the actual flow field induced by the presence of a rigid structure. So that would be for someone later, or perhaps after I'm done with this, I could start looking at fluid structures interaction. So how to model this bridge in fluid dynamics? Of course, you cannot take everything, or you can. You could take this entire structure, make a model, smack it into a CFD program, and compute it. However, because you have all of these different parameters, like you have the struts here, the trusses, these tunnels here, you have the tethers, you have the holders for the tethers here, and all of that means it would be hard to interpret your results when they came out. Maybe the results would be valid for that particular design, but they would not be useful if you wanted to say something about the general flow physics of your problem. So that is why you have to make simplifications, take most of this away, and then focus on flow physics, and later you can start adding. For instance, if I added this, May they, might they act as a splitter plate? Possibly. So, this is what you do. You take this curved, complex, flexible structure with all its struts and trusses and tethers, and then you simplify it into two straight, rigid, parallel cylinders. Tandem cylinders. And with that, you will be able to say a lot about the basics of the fluid dynamics issues related to the structure. In a cross section, this is what it looks like. You have your two cylinders and they are separated center to center by a distance L. So the ratio between uh, the gap distance and the diameter of the cylinder is called the gap ratio. And in tandem cylinder flow, the gap ratio and the Reynolds number are defining for the regime, the flow regime. You could have uh, a distance h, small h, to this free surface, and you could have a distance to the seabed. In my, my problems so far, I've looked at infinite fluids, so the presence of the surface and the presence of the seabed. If you look at the profile, the velocity profile of u, you have an incoming current, and that current will likely not be uniform. As you can see, the current velocities are higher towards the free surface and lower towards the seabed. That is because most of those are wind-induced currents, and they are, of course, faster at the surface. You could also simplify this and look at a uniform inflow, especially if you have an infinite fluid domain, like I do. So this is a 2D cross-section of a three-dimensional problem. Just so you know, I've looked at 3D, not 2D. So I'll go through full round tandem cylinders in brief. So the main points of flow around tandem cylinders is that they're governed by the disk between them. That is the main parameter. So if the distance between the cylinders is, is very small, then they will act like a single body. So you have the upstream cylinder, and then directly after it comes the downstream cylinder. And that means that the free shear layer, which separates from the upstream cylinder, does not be attached to the downstream cylinder. So it just passes over it, and then you will get a vortex street, which comes from the two bodies 
as a single entity, if you will. Now, a free share layer from the upstream cylinder will start reattaching onto the downstream cylinder. First, it will reattach onto the wake side of the cylinder, and then the reattachment point will move upstream. Then there is critical spacing at which vortices will start actually being shed in the gap between the two. All of these regimes, of course, are Reynolds number dependent. There you go. So here's a nice little drawing of this made by Alam. Now here, if you look at this, most, it's speaker they're using. Here you can see the single body regime. The free share layers separate here and then they just pass over and start rolling up to form a von Kármán vortex street downstream. Now when you further separate them, you see that the share layer is being sucked onto the downstream cylinder where it reattaches and then so technically the vortex street is still being formed by the upper cylinder, kind of. And then as you further see that the shear layers attach onto the upstream side of the downstream cylinder. So that is the region where I am at at the moment, and that is also the region where you would find especially the bureau of your design. And then you see as you go further, as you space them out further, you will have a bistable flow. So in this regime, sometimes the vortex uh, from the upper cylinder, and sometimes the share attaches, and this this could change spontaneously. So you could have both of them, and it would be impossible impossible to predict when they happen. And then as you go above the critical spacing, you have what you call the co-shedding regime, where there are vortex there are vortex streets from both of the cylinders. So on to the presentation of the work that I've been doing so far. So I have been, yes? Uh, could you try to turn off the video and see if the uh, audio is Cer improves a little bit? Certainly. Thank you. Oh, now it starts to move. Excuse me. Now, uh, there we are. So the case that I've been working on is based on the Bjorda Fjord SFTB. And that is to have some numbers some things. I've chosen a gap ratio of three because if you remember the Bjorn Fjord SFTB, it had a varying cross-sectional size, meaning that the gap ratio would vary somewhere between 2.5 and 3.4, if I remember correctly. So three was the natural gap ratio to choose. Also, gap ratio three is right in the middle of the reattachment regime for tandem cylinders. So that makes it hydrodynamically interesting. There is something happening there. Uh, so the Reynolds number I've chosen is 10,000. And that is a very low Reynolds number for an SFTB. Usually, if you had a current velocity of maybe 0.5 meters per second, you would definitely be in the millions with an SFTB. And a Reynolds number of 10,000 might constitute a current velocity of a couple of millimeters per second. I'm not saying that you will never have that current velocity, but it might be a little unrealistic. However, 10,000, that is just about how far you can push direct numerical simulations without the computational cost going completely haywire. 10,000 is actually a very high Reynolds number for DNS. But with doing DNS, you can get a very detailed picture of your flow, and you can use that as a benchmark for further study. So when you want to go to higher Reynolds numbers and you have to use simplified methods, you can benchmark them, the method against what you've done so far with DNS. Also, it seemed nobody had really done DNS for tan cylinders at that particular Reynolds number. 
So I was happy to choose that. So a Reynolds number of 10,000, that puts you in the transition in shear layer regime for a single cylinder, meaning that you expect the transition to turbulence to happen in the free shear layers. And you will see what that looks like later. My numerical method, like I said, it's direct numerical simulations. My governing equations are the Navier-Stokes, classic, and continuity. So the code I've been using is developed at the University of Munich. It's called MGLET. It's a finite solver for Cartesian grid, equidistant or non-equidistant. It has linear interpolation and integration in space, which means it will be second order accurate in space. And then it's third order accurate in time using a Runge-Koda method. It is an immersed boundary methods that they use for solid bodies. And I've been using ghost cells for those of you who are interested in that. So this is my numerical domain. I've used a very long domain because I was interested in the wake. And then I've kept the spacing, um, the, the spanwise spacing as short as I could while not compromising the results in order to get computational costs a little bit down. But I have to tell you, this is a pretty heavy simulation. You can see the number of elements is 987 million. Uh, you can see my inlet length, time step, all of that. And this is a representation of my grid resolution close to the body. So these, the grid that you see here, it's not the actual grid, but it represents the size. But if you look here, you can actually see where the elements are. You can see these little breaks here. They represent the actual elements. So this is in the boundary layer. So you can see I have a fairly good resolution of the boundary layer itself, which is, of course, necessary when you're doing DNS. So onwards to the results. I will start with the mean field, talk a little bit about separation, reattachment, and recirculation. I will go through the instantaneous flow features. And I'll talk about the effects of the upstream cylinder being submerged in the wake of the downstream cylinder, because that has a great effect on its flow field. And I will go through some of the characteristic frequencies, which are important for, uh, for uh, engineering purposes. And also, of course, interesting for more scientific purposes. So here you see the average, the time average flow field. You can see that, so the flow is coming in here from the left. And it separates here and recirculates. And then you have the reattachment. And it separates to form a vortex street downstream. So when you talk about this, it makes sense to separate into the gap region and the wake region. And I will start talking about the gap region. I've also done simulations with just a single cylinder. I'm not showing much of that here, but when I'm comparing this field with a single cylinder field, I'm talking about my own simulations. So as you can see, the separation happens at approximately 86 degrees. And that is actually sooner than what you have for a single cylinder, which would be, uh, in my case, 88. And other people have found up to 90. But that is because you have the pressure field created by the presence of the downstream cylinder. So you have the separation here. And then you have reattachment at approximately 62 degrees on the downstream cylinder. And then here you have the recirculation region. So what I've seen is that there are some large scale structures being created in the gap. You can see them right here. Um, but they're not really being shed. They're more created. And then they disintegrate. And then you start over from the top. So you have an oscillating creation of vortices in the gap. But they're not really being shed. 
that the recirculation creates the secondary separation on the back of the, of the upstream cylinder. So the flow follows around here, and then it separates and creates another separation bubble up here. So what I can see from my results is that the separation bubble here for tandem cylinders is further up, it's further up the hill, if you will, that for a single cylinder it's more down here. And I think that is simply because the flow is more retarded in this region than it is for a single cylinder. So it's able to fall longer and it doesn't separate until it's up here. So if you look at the pressure, you can see this, the curve of the upstream cylinder is very similar to that of a single cylinder except that the coefficient here in the back has a smaller absolute value than it would for a single cylinder. Now here, the downstream cylinder is completely different. Of course, it's being subjected to a completely different inflow. So here you have the peak here, which is associated with the reattachment of the shear layer from the upstream cylinder. I've compared my results to a study which has a slightly higher Reynolds number, but it looks good in terms of consistency. Now, if you draw a line from the back coefficient of the upstream cylinder, then you see that you almost hit directly on the curve of the downstream cylinder. And this is an indication, of course, that you have vortices that are circulating so it's more like a cavity type flow, really, than a vortex street flow. So these are quasi-stationary vortices being formed in the gap, but never shed. If you look at the instantaneous field, you see how complex it is. The field feels nice and ordered. Uh, the instantaneous field, not so much. Of course, this is a fully turbulent flow here in the gap. This is, by the way, vorticity that I'm using to present this. So you can see a number of interesting features. One of them, of course, is that uh, the transition happens in the shear layers, just like we were predicting if this were a single cylinder. But the free shear layers are longer than you have for a single cylinder, which indicates that the pressure field is different in the gap. And also, like I said, the separation happens earlier than for a single cylinder. It's impossible to see this from that image, but you could see it if you compare the mean field. So what you can see if you look at this in detail is, you know, for a hydrodynamicist, this is a wonderful picture. Just saying, this is a beautiful picture. If you look at A here, you can see these uh, what you call Kelvin Helmholtz instability waves. So Kelvin Helmholtz is uh, the name of the description of the actual instability in the shear layer. So just as the flow is transitioning to turbulence, the shear layers start oscillating up and down. And you can get these waves that you can see here. And then you see they start disintegrating and you have these irregular vortices that form and break down. If you look at the opposite side, you can see the formation of these shear layer vortices very nicely. So here you see the vortex with the, the shear layer starts oscillating and you get the formation of these beautiful little vortex, this beautiful little vortex street here. So like I said, the vortices they travel and then they start breaking up. You can see it here. They get more disordered and you can see it here. And then you have the large scale. So the fluid travels, you have the small scale vortices here and they go in to this bigger structure here. So that is what you were seeing in the mean field, those large recirculation areas those were the mean field representation of what you can see happening here. So you have this curl here of quasi-steady vortex structure, and that structure drags 
the boundary layer of the upstream cylinder with it. So sometimes, not all the time, you get this shedding of smaller shear layer vortices from the upstream side of the downstream cylinder here, and they shed into the gap. Here you can see what it looks like from a broader perspective. This is the Q criterion, by the way, co uh, colored by vorticity. So you can see these tubes here are the shear layer vortices that are being shed by the upstream cylinder into the gap. So you can see that, that there is no, they are not coherent across the span of the cylinder. They are smaller structures, and you see that they break up pretty fast. Like if you come out here, they've already started picking up smears that impinge on the downstream cylinder. Now, as you can see, this is a very turbulent field hitting the downstream cylinder, and we will get back to that. You can get a measure of the coherence if you plot the vertical velocity across the span in time. So this side here is taken from uh, inside the shear layer. So here you can see these, let's see if I can get my pointer back, there we go. So this is a representation of the smaller shear layer vortices. So you can see they are not coherent in space. They show up intermittently. And here, this is taken from a probe directly upstream in the middle of the downstream cylinder. Uh, and here you can see that there is definitely a strong coherence. Here's sort of, you can see the vortex here, then another, then another, then another. So there's a definite periodicity to the large-scale vortices that are being formed in the gap. Now, if we look at the wake region, here you see the separation it happens quite late. You see you've already passed the 90 degrees and you go to the upstream, or no, sorry, you go to the downstream side of the cylinder where it happens. And then you have the recirculation region, which is indicative of a vortex streak. And if you look at the instantaneous field, you can see this large von Karman vortex streak, which is made up by a whole bunch of smaller vortex filaments. As you can see, there are no, excuse me, oh, never mind. So as you can see, there is no fingering, or these fingering is what you call the longer streamwise vortex structures that you will, would see for a single cylinder. So there is no fingering here. There's only these very small structures that are being coeased into larger vortexes, vortices. Now, so like I said, the downstream cylinder is completely entrained in the wake of the upstream cylinder. So what it sees, it's not the nice uniform inflow that the upstream cylinder gets. It basically gets a mess. So it has this completely turbulent inflow. Now, many people have done experiments and simulations with a single cylinder where they add a little bit of free stream turbulence. So maybe you would have a turbulence intensity between 1 and 10%, 10 being quite high. Now, in practice, the turbulence intensity of the downstream cylinder that it gets is maybe 100. So you can compare it to the free stream turbulence cases, but of course it's a lot more extreme. Now the effect of incoming free stream turbulence is enhanced transition to turbulence in the shear layers. So the more turbulent the inflow, um, the lower is the Reynolds number where you would get transition in the shear layer. And that means you move the flow regime a bit higher up in terms of Reynolds number than it actually is if you look at the, the incoming flow velocity. And then you get enhanced mixing and entrainment, and this, this uh, influences the vortex shedding and the vortex stream. 
and enhances breakdown, basically. So your vortices break down faster if you have incoming turbulence. And also the presence of the cylinder itself um, influences the free stream turbulence that is incoming, but that is not so much of interest to us because it's already fully turbulent. So whatever happens there is not, not very different to what it already was. So, and here comes my single cell. So if you compare the two, you can see right away that there's a large difference. For instance, the separation, it happens at 88 degrees for the single cylinder, but it's at 100 and almost 120 for the downstream cylinder. And if you look at the wake, you see that it's a lot narrower. So you have a pretty fat wake up here, then you have a leaner, smaller wake for the downstream cylinder. Now, this also influences the recirculation region here. You can see that the length here from the cylinder to the end of the vortex formation or recirculation region is a lot shorter here. And you have no secondary separation. See here? There's really only a slight indication that something could be happening here but I haven't been able to find any actual secondary separation, which you definitely have here for the cylindrical cylinder. Now, all of these features are features that you would find for flow regimes with a higher Reynolds number. So that means, in effect, the downstream cylinder experiences a completely or a different Reynolds number, effective Reynolds number, than the upstream cylinder. And that will, of course, influence the pressure distribution. It will influence uh, the forces that the cylinder feels. And it will influence the shedding. If you look at the instantaneous field, you can see that it's nowhere near as nice and ordered. As you see, for that upstream cylinder, you had the shear layers coming out laminarly. And then they started oscillating, and you had transition to turbulence. Now, for the downstream cylinders, you don't really have an elongated free shear layer at all. You can see here, they're just very short, and they're being distorted by the flow immediately. Sometimes, though, you do have a little bit of a shear layer, and you get the shedding of shear layer vortices. But this only happens intermittently. I haven't been able to find a dominant frequency for that. And then what also happens is you have these vortices or these smaller turbulent vortices coming in and they disturb the boundary layer. So you have vorticity being swept out of the boundary layer by passing eddies like here. Now this doesn't actually offset the boundary layer in being turbulent. So you still have a laminar boundary layer, but it's being disturbed quite frequently. What I've also seen that you, you don't see here is a kind of erratic elongation here of the free shear layers. That sometimes happens, but it's also very intermittent. There's no predictability about it. So I'll, as I see it, what this means is that you have features of several flow regimes for the cylinder, like they coexist. So you have features of higher regimes, and then you have, like this, features of the regime that you would expect for the Reynolds number that you have at the upstream cylinder. And that is quite interesting. So. Oh, yeah. Uh, going on to the frequencies. So what I've done is that I've put probes in the flow where you see them now, and they are uh, I've put probes also all of the span of the cylinder in all of these positions. There are actually 12 positions for each of these that you see so that you can get a good average. So this is kind of the, the time trace of velocity that you can get out from one of these probes. So what happens, oh, so I've sampled 
for quite a long time actually. I started after 200 cycles and that is because sometimes it takes a long time for the recirculation region itself to establish and not develop anymore. So I wanted to start late enough so I knew that everything was nice and developed and I sampled for a very long time 157 cycles because I wanted a good average and I wanted to make sure that there were no uh, long time period features that I weren't catching. And like I said, uh, I've done spanwise probes and I've taken the average spectra from these probes. Uh, so what you have, like you can see, is that there is strong oscillations here. This is taken from inside the shear layer. And shear layer instabilities don't necessarily manifest continuously, like you can get them intermittently. Sometimes the shear layer is just floating along and sometimes you get these waves. Now that is for low Reynolds numbers. When you get close to 10,000, you expect these frequencies 100% of the time. And you can see that, like if I took just a single part of the time trace you can see there and I run a spectra on it, you would still find the shear layer frequencies. Uh, but you have these strong oscillations. So the shear layer oscillates with a strong amplitude uh, sometimes. It doesn't happen with a, a period or it doesn't happen with a period that I've been able to catch, but every once in a while you get these stronger oscillations in the shear layer, which is interesting. So this is a representation of the spectra that I've been using. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see a probe in the shear layer, the one that we saw the time trace from just now. And on the right-hand side, you see uh, a probe from the actual large-scale vortex street. If we look at that one first, you see that the fundamental frequency is about 0.60. Now for a single cylinder, you expect about 0.2. That is the standard, the standard Struhal number, if you will, over a longer, a long range of Reynolds numbers. So uh, in, in terms of uh, everyday speaking, basically, this means that the, the vortices are being shed with a longer interval between them. Now, the, the fundamental frequency that I found is consistent with the literature, as you can see. In the spectra, you also have the harmonics. These here are harmonics of the fundamental frequency. Now, if we look at the shear layer peaks, this is quite interesting because you can only just see the fundamental frequency here. But what you can see is that you have this broadband spectrum that represent the shear layer frequencies. So you have not a single peak, but you have many. So this is kind of what you expect also for a single cylinder. But you have like a three, you have a tri-peak spectrum, if you will, that there are some frequencies that are more present in the flow or have a stronger energy in the flow. Your main peak is about 2.5 for this. So if we compare it to a single cylinder, this is not me, this is uh, Dong and his associates that also did a CF or a DNS study of a cylinder at 10,000. You can see here that he also has this broadband spectrum, uh, but you cannot see the peaks. This could be his sampling time because when you have these stronger oscillations in the shear layer that I showed you, and they don't ha really have a periodicity, but it means that the longer you sample, um, the more of these strong oscillations you will catch, meaning that the energy in the spectrum grows the longer you sample. So this was also seen by uh, Prasad and Williamson, who did the study on shear layer intermittency. They saw that if they sample longer, the energy content and the shear layer frequency grows. 
So it could be that he hasn't sampled very long and this is why you're not seeing the peaks. You know, if you're being a little imaginative, there could be a peak here and there could be a peak here. What I do see is that, well, first of all, I have three peaks. And second of all, I have higher frequencies than what he has in his spectrum. Um, and also he has a pretty strong component of the fundamental frequency. So basically what you can, the conclusion you can draw from this is that you have a larger, uh, a larger spread of shared layer frequencies for the tandem cylinder case. So just so you can see the bigger picture from this, here's where you have the shear layer frequencies. And this is the large scale shedding here. Now I see that I'm starting to get to the end. So just a summary of this is that I've studied the flow around tandem cylinders, which is a simplified representation of a submerged floating tube bridge, a very simplified representation, at a Reynolds number of 10,000. And uh, like I said, that is in order to get a good knowledge of the physical processes of tandem cylinders. And you can do that when you have a low Reynolds number, where the results are easier to interpret. So what I've seen is that the shear layer from the upstream cylinder reattaches onto the downstream cylinder, and that is what you would expect for this flow regime. The fundamental frequency, it's a bit lower than for a single cylinder, also consistent with the literature. Like I just showed you, I've resolved the shear layer instabilities, and you could see that there's a broad-banded spectrum, three peaks, and the frequencies are somewhat higher than the single, for the single cylinder. Now for the downstream cylinder, like I said, you can see that it has features from higher flow regimes that coexist with features from the flow regime you would expect for Reynolds number 10,000. So what am I doing now? So I am here in Iowa City because uh, for some reason, one of the best hydrodynamics groups in the US exist in a state that is completely landlocked. So we have no ocean, but we have a good ocean basin and good people. So I'm here to uh, investigate the effects of the free surface on the SFTB. So the closer you are to the free surface, the more pronounced the influence is. Like if you moved your cylinder completely close to the free surface and you only had this tiny gap then you would get almost like a jet flow above it, as if you had a rock in a river, and the river was just flowing directly above it. And of course, the further downstream you go, the smaller the influence is. But what we can expect is that there will be a deflection of the wake away from the free surface if you move your cylinder to maybe a diameter below it. So this is what they seen for a single cylinder. But we will see if it acts the same way for tandem cylinders. So, yeah, I will be working with Professor Fredster using their code CFD Ship Iowa, doing uh, unsteady simulations and also direct eddy simulations and large eddy simulations for this. And doing those simplified methods, I can also go to higher Reynolds numbers, which are closer to what the actual SFTB will see in terms of flow velocities. And I think I will stop here and hear if you have any questions. Ooh, reference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stala, for uh, a very good presentation. Um, I think that will uh, open up for uh, questions now. Any questions? Seems that things were 
perfectly clear to everyone. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I'm glad. Um, well, uh, I can start off with or Jungo. Yeah, <laughs> if if uh, nobody asks, so I have some small questions. <laughs> so first, uh, uh, thanks a lot for Tala for a very nice presentation. And um, so uh, I think you've been talking about the uh, share layers and uh, flow attachment and very detailed things about the buffalo uh, strut uh, I mean I mean the flow around structures so the first question would be you talked about the correlation uh, mm -hmm. for the upstream cylinder and also the downstream cylinder if I'm not yes. uh, misun misunderstanding your conclusion is it's more correlated for the downstream or in between in between the two cylinders compared yes. to the ones uh, upstream right Exactly, but uh, but but as but as you said that uh, that actually it gets much much more turbulent in between the two cylinders. But how would that uh, how to say explain the, the correlation? Because if you have more turbulent flow, then then you should actually have less correlation. Um, uh, well, it's it's uh, a difference between uh, the shear layer vortices. And the large scale, so you have yeah. a, a, a strong large scale like these. You can, you can still see my screen, right? Yeah. Yes. So these vertices here, this is what you can see from the time trace here. Yeah. And that is happening. So th that time trace I just showed you is taken from a probe right here. Yeah. So, 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 so basically you are not comparing... Uh, I'm not comparing these two no. uh, directly, no. Hmm. Okay. So you are only considering the correlation for a certain probe? Yes. Not in terms yes, so of the... Like, okay. No, this is kind of the internal correlation, if you will. Yeah, so, so that's what... Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so that comes to the second question, maybe? Mm -hmm. um, in, in the spectrum you showed... Uh, uh, I think uh, the one you showed uh, about the broad uh, spectrum for the shared area instability. Yes. And uh, it seems that uh, the the peak for the uh, FV here is very low. Uh, why is that? So uh, I think that is because uh, in reality it's not super low. It's just that the others are so high. And that is, I think, because of these oscillations that you see. So these are very high energy and the longer you sample the more of them you actually sample. So that means the longer you sample uh, the higher these peaks get. Yeah but but I think also in terms of from the structure point of view I mean what the, your cylinder is is experienced probably it's not so fair uh, that you only take one probe to do the spectrum analysis but you should probably also do the spa space averaging around the cylinder um, for the spectrum. And then probably, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking it in terms of uh, more related to the, the, the load uh, that the cylinder is, is experiencing, right? So do you have any plan yes. to do that or to do it? Because um, I understand that you do the averaging span-wise, span right? But, but you are not yes. doing the circum... Yeah. No, I, I hadn't any plan to do that, but now I do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Because uh, I think, from an engineering point of view, probably it's more interesting to see um, to to correlate uh, what you have done in terms of the fluid around the cylinder, but also cor corresponding to the load um, for the entire structure, right? So. That's true. Yeah. So I would probably go on and do that when I did higher Reynolds numbers because this is unrealistically low, right? This is more yeah. like a benchmark. Yeah. But I would definitely try and do that when I go to higher Reynolds numbers. Mm. And also I think it's if you want to compare the upstream and downstream cylinder, it's also not so fair to compare one point. I mean, because as you have said in your slides, the, the vortex shading for the upstream and downstream uh, cylinder is totally different. And yes. uh, it's, yeah, so it's kind of biased if you just choose one point to, to present uh, that. 
It's true. Mm. So for those, from an engineering point of view, it would be better better to like to look at the loading on these. So for this study, I've been more interested in um, the pure fluid dynamics part and not so interested in the engineering type load. Yeah. Um, yeah sure. But it yes. will come later. Definitely. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Yeah. Thanks, Ringo. Is there anyone else who has any uh, questions for Talon? Uh, I can ask a question, uh, Tala. You, uh, as you commented several times, you have a very low Reynolds number. And yes. how high can you actually expect your uh, computations to be able to run with your Reynolds number? Well, it depends on the method you use. Like if you go to uh, LES, you will be able to go to, uh, like for instance. 10 to the fifth, 200 times 10 to the fifth. Uh, and then if you go to your rounds, of course, you can go a lot higher. Then you could easily do completely realistic Reynolds numbers. But of course, you lose uh, you lose some of the details on the way. But for engineering purposes, your rounds is completely valid. So you could get to realistic Reynolds numbers. OK. <laughs> But in uh, real fjords, then you also have got the certification, and you have been running this homogeneously, right? Yes. So uh, I don't think density stratification will be a part of my PhD, uh, but I could definitely look at a share current or a share flow mm -hmm. with a more realistic uh, inflow profile. Hmm. No, I wouldn't expect you to start doing uh, doing uh, different stratifications for this PhD. That's uh... no, I I've never <laughs> dealt with compressible flows, so I think I will stick to incompressible uh, for this one. Hmm. But a share current is definitely something I should do. Yeah, a great presentation. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. I'm glad. Okay. Is there anyone else who also have any questions to Tala? No? Okay. I think they've been quite long enough then. Thank you so much, Tala, for a very nice presentation. Um, this presentation will be available uh, uh, online. Um, uh, we'll discuss at what point it might be uh, made available. But I'll also inform you guys about the next webinar that we have, uh, which is already tomorrow uh, by uh, Zhongao Wang, who uh, was one of the people asking questions here. The topic for tomorrow's webinar is the aerodynamics of a novel stay cable cross-sectional shape. So uh, with that, I will thank you all for uh, joining this webinar and thank you once again Tala for a very nice presentation and uh, have a nice day. Have a nice day. Thank you. Have a nice day guys.